Welcome to another episode of the Weekend Write-In Podcast. I'm your ghost, I mean host, Sovan Drake. And I'm John Nedwell. <laughs> I thought the evil episode was two podcasts ago. Sorry, can't help it. It just seems to happen whenever I think evil thoughts. Is this better? <laughs> well, it fits in better with our theme for this podcast. Oh yes, it's Halloween. The time of the autumn mists, the season of the witch. <laughs> I thought you'd fixed that. So did I. In our spooky 13th episode, we'll listen to some Halloween-themed stories from some of our weekend write-in regular contributors, as well as hear from some new authors we haven't heard before. These include Bersabe Jonas from Ethiopia, Thomas Nielsen from Denmark, Berengaria de Rossi from Germany, and Sean Kennedy from John's Neck of the Woods in England. Yes, we've got a lot to get through this time. <laughs> oh dear. But first we've got to get this atmosphere and that evil laughing under control. And quickly, not like that rocket of yours. That wasn't my fault. Well, all right, not entirely my fault. Sleep by Thomas Nielsen I hate these pills They help me sleep but at some point during the night I awaken No, not wake up I become aware That's it It's as if my senses begin to stick out like rivets in a boiler Reality ratcheting across those bulging heads seeps in through the narrow seams into my already overwrought dreams and much, much worse, my conscience leaks out, extrapolating anxieties and fears from all those crippled senses. She's right there behind me, presence, odd really. I can't hear her breathing, and I'm pretty certain she didn't move at all. But I know she's there. Please, let me sleep or let me awaken, not this. I can't even weep. All body functions are disabled, shut down. Only my brain works. Some of it. And my heart. I can feel it beating frantically. She comes nearer. No motion. Suddenly she's simply a heartbeat closer. My eyelids are half open, but I can't see her. It's too dark for her to cast a shadow over me. And how would a shadow even cast a shadow? I know she's nothing more. An apparition in my dark bedroom. Oh dear God. I can see her now. A tall shadow by the foot of my bed. I wield all my strength and command my body to move, to turn. But it will not. All it does is send beads of sweat into my eyes, blurring my already distorted vision. How can my mind betray me so? My own mind? I know this is not real, yet it insists upon it and denies me my own objectivity. Could I only put my hand out and have it dispel the spirit? And then I know that if I could, I wouldn't dare. For what if it was not a phantom? What if it had substance? What terrors would it then produce? My heart beats even faster. What Sisyphean task this is to demand of this one muscle that it stops. First, I'm relieved. Then the pain comes. Morning, dear. Did you sleep well? Honey? Witch Monster by M.S. Miller there are few things in life which can more perfectly shatter a sound sleep than the scream of a child. My wife and I shuffled as we heard a cry from our youngest child's room. It wasn't a normal scream. He didn't ask for mommy or daddy specifically. It was an ear-curdling wail for help. We both shuffled lightly. He'll go back to sleep, I whispered to my wife. It was just a bad nightmare. I received an unintelligible response. She was still mostly asleep. 
I had almost drifted back asleep when the cry became more intense, more frightened, more filled with terror. My wife sat up immediately. I was already half out of the bed. I'll get him, I groaned. These things always happened on Sunday night. The whole week's sleep schedule would be thrown out of whack. Daddy, he said softly in a voice I hadn't expected. Hurry. I shuffled into the room, my eyes still blurred with sleep. I cursed under my breath as my foot was pierced by a toy on the dark floor. What's wrong? I tried not to sound annoyed. Only his head stuck out from under the covers. His face was locked in sheer terror. It must have been a bad nightmare. It's under there, he motioned toward the floor under the bed. What's under there? A monster. I relaxed a little, remembering my own fear of the dark decades ago. Only the imagination of a child was able to twist the shadows into horrifying beasts keen on gobbling up a kid in bed. It's okay, I'm here. I went to sit on the bed, but he forbade it. Look, please. There was an urgency in his voice that gave me pause. Seldom did anything upset my little guy like this. Let's have a look. I thought I saw something move under the bed, but it was dark and my eyes hadn't adjusted to the low light. I theorized that it was the cat. It's just Plinky, I said, trying to convince him. No, he said emphatically. It's not. Sure it is. I saw him. I wasn't all that convincing. No, it's a monster. It talked to me. I finally relented and walked over to turn the light on. Again, the damn toy got me. I was hoping to avoid turning the light on. It would surely cost me an hour of prime sleep now. I got down on my hands and knees and peered under the bed. At first I didn't see anything, then it became clear there was an outline of something under there. Then it moved toward me. As the light hit the object, I felt the blood drain out of my face. I hoped I was dreaming, but I knew I was awake. The face of my child, the same child who was shaking with terror in the bed, appeared slowly from under the bed. Daddy, the doppelganger said, is the monster still in my bed? Bloody Hand by Sylvan Drake A breeze rustles the tall grass in a deserted meadow on a warm summer day. I never want to hurt you, I hear her whisper to her lover. His eyes are closed as she lets me caress his face. I run my small fingers gently over the delicate skin of his eyelids, down his strong jaw, and over his lips. I entrance him. Then she moves me aside and kisses those lips, practically breathing the words into his lungs. So you should leave me now. Never, he groans nearly inaudibly as he pulls her down on top of him. I'm entwined in his curly brown hair as they make love in the late afternoon sun. I love him too now, but unlike hers, mine is a dark, obsessive, sinister love. Her beauty captivates him like it has so many others. Her long black hair hangs in loose curls around high cheekbones, a perfect nose and big bright green, albite wizened eyes, eyes that have witnessed too much. Darkness, my darkness, hangs in the air around her like an erotic tincture. He doesn't understand it and he doesn't care. He is in ecstasy. There is a fantasy world where time expands and contracts. Marble seas rise and consume gods at war. Stars and moons collide, giving birth to fiery dragons. But in her kingdom, they eat ripe berries and laugh while the juice dribbles down their chins. They dance to the wind and pleasure one another until they fall into a deep, dreamless slumber every night. He knows he is a fool and is helpless to run from her. I smile to myself and wait patiently. They sleep atop white down that softens the large four-poster bed in her castle on the hill. The night is alive and moves freely in and out of the large open arch windows, a witness to the beauty's evil. They hover in the bubble, the bewitched hours after midnight and before dawn. 
It is always then when she cries out in pain and wraps me in a towel. When he tries to help or offer solace, she pushes him away. This only makes his wanting stronger. He ignores the mounting evidence of the danger, a mortal danger growing stronger each night. There is no doubt as to the outcome anymore. On Halloween, the moon disappears in a cloudless sky. A marked man, he wakes with a start. He turns and gazes at her beautiful face, heavenly in slumber for the last time. A single tear treks down his cheek. Turning, he looks up at the bats and moths dancing among the rafters above, fully accepting his fate. He feels me inch towards him and delicately wrap my fingers around his throat and squeeze. Slowly at first, he doesn't struggle and because I belong to her, I arouse his desire. I grip harder until he takes only little gasping breaths. I keep him on the edge, giving him just enough air to live a little longer. His sight is getting dim. With full force, I puncture the skin of his neck and he bleeds out quickly. He dies euphoric, knowing she will wake and weep for his death, while cradling her bloody hand. Hi, this is Tom Walborn. When I found out that the theme for October was going to be horror stories, I was just a bit worried because I don't do horror. But I sat down with pen in hand and uh, created a story. Hope you enjoy it. Here is my Halloween story. The Swanson house was haunted. Everyone knew it. Old Mrs. Swanson had been gone for more than five years, and yet this house still sat empty up on its little knoll. It was probably haunted long before she passed. She used to throw Halloween parties there in the great ballroom for the neighborhood children. That hasn't stopped just because she's died. It has just taken a different form. It is called the fifth grade challenge. No one knows when it started, but the rules are simple. Fifth grade boys must stay in the house for 15 minutes on Halloween night to claim bragging rights. Girls are not invited. It is assumed that they would not last, so why try? This year, Nathan and his buddy Jerry announced that they were going to be the first to stay the course. There were no other takers. Family and friends gathered on the sidewalk to wish them well and to witness their heroic feat. Their dads had already checked out the ballroom earlier in the day to make sure the floors were still safe and no other hazards lurked in what would be a very dark room. At promptly 8 p.m., the boys were standing in the shadows on the porch. Their family cheered. The door creaked. The dark gloom of the hallway beckoned them in. They entered, and the door swung shut behind them with a resounding thunk. The boys were each allowed a flashlight and nothing else. Following instructions, they turned to the right and entered a smallish room, walked through that, and were in the ballroom. Their flashlights could not penetrate very far into the gloom. Even the air above their heads was dark. They made their way to two overstuffed chairs and sat and waited. The room was not silent. You would think that after a hundred years, the house would be done settling, would be ready for a rest. There were creaks and groans, a shutter slammed, and the wind rustled through the halls. According to Jerry's sister, the unofficial timekeeper, they lasted six minutes. When they ran out, they were brushing their clothes and yelling about spiders and bats. Nathan kept saying, Get it off! Get it off! Billy and Jake Lewandowski collapsed to the floor laughing. Did you hear him when I dropped that fake spider on him? I thought he was going to pee his pants. Yeah, his brother Jake gasped, but that fake bat on the fishing pole was brilliant. The twins were seventh graders, and it fell to them this year to spook the younger boys. Such are the traditions of rural American towns. The older boys had situated themselves in a small balcony above the ballroom. This gave them an excellent vantage point for their shenanigans. A low moan cut through their laughter. A second moan really got their attention. The moans seemed to come from all around them. The boys laughed nervously and incorrectly assumed it was their buddy Frank trying to spook them. Another moan and another echoed around the empty ballroom. Then a voice, an old lady by the sound of it, beseeched, No! No! Then she screamed. 
It was a long, undulating scream that didn't just end, but died off in a strangled gasp, as though the poor old soul had used every ounce of breath in her body. The boys were on their feet and trying to both get down the narrow stairway to the ballroom floor at the same time. Jake fell, misjudging the last step. Billy tripped over him. Both were still laying on the ballroom floor when the final scream pierced their ears. It was heart-stopping, full of agony and anguish. It stopped as suddenly as it started, cut short at its peak. By what? The silence was just as unnerving as the screams had been. What had happened? Should they try to find the source? Or should they just get out now while they could? The twins were full of youthful bravado, but they were a young thirteen. Without discussing it, they had both separately decided that discretion was a better part of valor. What happened next just added a bit of unnecessary impetus to their decision. <laughs> it echoed from the ceiling and the walls. It was so very loud and laced with evil. It brought to mind all of the crazy horror movies the boys had ever watched. They spilled out the front door, which slammed behind them, raced down the rickety porch stairs, and dashed through the crowd of onlookers still standing on a sidewalk. Seventeen minutes, not bad, one of the watchers remarked. Inside the house, in a small room off the ballroom that could have been a servant's pantry, two teenage girls silently gave each other a high five. In their youth, they had been denied the fun of the fifth grade challenge and the seventh grade spook out because they were girls. That special effects megaphone was awesome. Should we go and find them and let them know it was us? Samantha asked. Ronnie thought for a minute. No, wait here. Let's give it another ten minutes. That way we could prove that girls are tougher. They were watched by an older man who ran his thumb over the edge of his knife. It was very sharp. Absently sucking the blood from the cut, he thought, maybe I'll start with the bigger one, the blonde. Outside, the crowd was starting to leave when a thin scream cut the air. It was different from the earlier screams, younger, with more urgency and, if possible, more terror. People stopped moving and stood facing the house, waiting expectantly. But there was nothing else. Hmph, an old lady snorted. It lasted a lot longer in our day. Her friend Janice took her arm to help her to the car. Well, Murdy, he only had 500 words to work with. The End Halloween with Rudy by Versabe Jonas. Hello, I'm Rudy, and I'm here to share how I spent this Halloween with my owners and their family. On this day, I learned the most important lesson in my life. I know, I'm a dog. I don't live that long. But meh, it's not the length that matters. It's the understanding. My owners, the Banks family, have four kids. Two of the older ones are the girls, Lillian and Kimberly, and the younger boys are the twins, Dave and Dale. Their parents, Mr. Morgan and Miss Holly. Lillian is the oldest. She's 17 and had won every beauty pageant she's been in since she was 12. Kimberly is 14 and interested in music. The twins are both 10, Dave being the popular one in school, and Dale, well, he was a weird one. You could find him doing weird stuff. And by weird, I mean really weird. Like dissecting cockroaches as a hobby. Anyways, back to Halloween. The Banks family holiday reception went like this. Miss Holly helped the kids find costumes, choosing a family theme, and decorating the house. Mr. Morgan kept a cheerful and supportive spirit, despite the fact that he thought this was a waste of time and money. The kids helped their mother out, continuously bugging their father for more money, burning seven porch lights. You should have seen the look on Mr. Morgan's face when he heard they needed to buy new lights. Dave and their friends pranked Dale, dressed like ghosts, because he was terrified of them. The kid thought it wouldn't hurt to jump over a flight of stairs than to encounter a bunch of kids wearing white bed sheets. Well, that's when he was wrong. It really hurts. 
He ended up with a broken leg and he was unable to go trick or treating. Dave was too bored to go on his own and the girls stayed home for dinner before they left for the fest. We all got together for dinner and I see the happiness in everybody's face. This sounds like a Christmas or a Thanksgiving evening with everyone smiling and sharing and talking but it doesn't have to be Christmas or Thanksgiving or even Easter to be happy. I learned that to be happy you only have to be with your family. It can even be a spooky holiday like Halloween. You're happy when you have your family with you. Whether it's Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving or even Halloween. A holiday is always a holy day when you have your family with you. All their flaws, all their mistakes are what makes them perfect. A holiday is never a holiday if you ain't got your family with you. This is not a Christmas story. This is a Halloween story. Because Halloween stories don't always have to be bone chilling, spooky or scary stories. They can be a happy family story. Happy Halloween! Coffee Killer by Berengaria de Rossi, narrated by Sylvan Drake. The guy at my feet looks pretty dead, but I don't have time to be happy about that right now. I gotta get some coffee. The hallway I'm stumbling down is a dim, gray, wallowing pit, but all I'm thinking is, kitchen, kitchen, where's your goddamn kitchen? A coffee maker is what I really need. I don't give a shit about the kitchen. I need a fat-bellied 10-cup capacity pot and a new brick of freeze-dried grounds. I need Arabica, Columbia Blend, Circle F Mark Crap Beans. I don't care. I gotta get some coffee in my system fast. Kitchen, where's the coffee maker? There's only an ancient-looking toaster on the three dinky feet of counter space. I can't use a toaster. Piles of dirty dishes in the sink, the stove, ditto with dirty pans. I'm ripping open cabinets now. Dry goods, cans, spam. Are you kidding me? Were those squishy pieces in the spaghetti sauce spam chunks? I'd feel sick if I wasn't already shaking. Instant. There's got to be some petrified instant in here somewhere. Bastard. Not even instant? Oh great, now I'm starting to hallucinate. In my hand, I can feel the warm glow of the jumbo coconut latte I was holding a week ago when that psychopath shoved a gun in my side and forced me into his truck, leaving all that precious coffee splattered on the asphalt of the coffee shop parking lot. Coffee shop, that's the answer. I'm out the door and into the weed-filled yard before facts register in my caffeine-deprived brain. I've got no money. I don't even know where I am. Fields? Trees? Fields? Some sheds or something? Great. I was kidnapped by a lonely farmer. That explains the stupid granny dress and pearls he gave me to wear and the moth-eaten slippers on my feet. Probably missed his mommy too much. The breeze out here smells like macchiato. He's still dead. I got a fork rammed in the side of his neck. Money! Keys! Coffee! I scream at him as I shove open different doors. My shoes are in his bedroom along with the rest of my clothes. I don't even want to know. I just put them on. There's 20 bucks in the wallet on his night table. My wallet now. No keys. Damn! can't believe it. The keys are in the truck's ignition. Where am I? Mayberry? I'm tripping so badly as I pull out onto the road. I could swear the pine freshener dangling from the rear view is filling the cab with the fiery, sensuous smell of espresso. And now, as I'm looking for road signs to direct me back to town, the only thought going through my brain is, oh god, I could kill for a cup of coffee. I could kill for a cup of coffee. I could, I could kill for a cup of coffee. And then I think, oh wait, I just did. Kohada Koheiji by John Nedwell They met on nights with no moon, when the only light came from the stars that wheeled across the heavens. They would come together to play the game of Hyaku Monogatari, the game of 100 ghost stories. The game was simple. A cluster of oil lamps would be set in the middle of the room, one lamp per person. Then the friends would gather in a circle around the lamps to tell each other tales of Yuri, Yokai, and Mamono, tales of horror and terror. At the end of their tale, the storyteller would extinguish one of the lamps, and the next person would take their turn. So, as the night wore on, and more stories were told, 
the circle of light would shrink and the circle of friends would draw closer together. Finally, at the end of the night, when the last person had told their story, the last lamp would be extinguished and the room would be plunged into darkness. According to tradition, that was the signal for the spirits to rise, to acclaim the best story of the night and to honour the teller of that story. Of course, nobody believed this, or so they said to each other as they made their ways back home. After all, they had been playing Hyaku Monogatari for over a year. On this night, Yoshi wanted to be the last. He had a special tale to tell, the tale of Kohada Koheiji. So he bowed his time, waiting for the others to finish their stories and extinguish their lamps. Finally, as the shadows filled the room, Yoshi spoke. It is my turn, he said. Tonight I shall tell you the tale of Kohada Koheiji. The others sat up and looked attentively at Yoshi. None of them had ever heard this story before. This would be something new to thrill them. Yoshi continued. Once upon a time, there was an actor named Kohada Koheiji. He was a fortunate man, for he had wealth and fame and a beautiful wife. But what he did not know was that his wife was in love with another, and so she conspired with her lover to murder her husband and take his riches. Yoshi leaned closer to the lamp, so the shadows deepened across his face. To the others in the circle, it looked like he had donned an oni mask from a kabuki play. Their plan was simple. They would wait for Koheiji-san as he made his way back from the theatre. Then they would waylay him and slit his throat. That way he would not be able to cry for help. They would dispose of his corpse in the swamp, where it would soon be eaten by the fish and worms. No one would ever find the body. And so the plan was put into motion. Kohada Koheiji's throat was slit, and his body was dropped into the swamp, where it vanished into the black waters without trace. Yoshi lowered his voice, so the others had to move closer still to hear him. Three nights later, Koheiji-san's shameless wife was lying with her lover in her marital bed. They were entwined in lusty embrace, unaware of what was going on. Meanwhile, in the swamp, the body of Kohada Koheiji had returned to life. He remembered what had happened to him, and he wanted vengeance. So he climbed out of the swamp and made his way home. Through the window, he saw his wife and her lover. The sight enraged his spirit. Silently, he climbed through the window, into the room. Quietly, he made his way to the bed. He pulled back the mosquito net and reached out towards the murderous pair, and... Yoshi took a deep breath, as if about to speak again, then blew out the lamp. As he did so, he placed a cold hand upon the neck of his neighbour. The shriek of terror echoed through the night, much to Yoshi's satisfaction. Warmth by Sean Kennedy The corpse of a fire lay cold between them. The man spat spirited insults through intoxicated gasps. The boy sat upon the petrified log and watched a spotted frog emerge from the ashes. A sudden slap switched his attention. We're gonna freeze, boy. Do something. The boy, rigid, looked up to the man. High above, many moving stars dotted the open night sky. Upon no response, the man struck again before the child rolled off a log and distanced himself. Stop hitting me. You'll do as you're told. You're not my dad. I'm the only one out here who'll take care of you. Now sit your ass down before I put a blade in it. Metal glinted under starlight. The boy still marveled at the design of a dagger. He was once told kids should never touch knives, yet the dragon-shaped handle was similar to an old nightlight he once had. I see that got your attention. Now, come start the fire, quick now. Silently the boy approached the cinders and retrieved the flint from the tatty backpack. If they don't work, use sticks. Everything's wet. Ain't wet. Just damp, boy. Damp. It'll burn, damn it. No slacking. With a few clacks, sparks flew, and amber grew underneath a detritus. The man slumped upon a log on the other side. Once the bottle plinked and rolled from his fingers, the boy knew he had passed out. I'm sorry, boy, it ain't easy. Those words rattled through the boy's mind as he huddled closer. He had long given up on the fire. 
but blood was wet but hot. When he first slipped the stomach, he observed the steam that escaped. It looked like the dragon was blowing smoke. The man provided little protest to the act. Perhaps he too knew it was for the best. Just as he told the boy his family's deaths were the products of survival of the fittest. The boy breathed deeply, pulling the third coat over him. The smell of innards had begun to smother the usual foul odours. For the first time in a while there was a moment of comfort. Memories of his dog, his mum and his sister dreamily drifted by. A faint shriek could be heard somewhere behind him, but he paid it no mind. Instead he motionlessly watched the glow bug by the would-be fire. Slowly it crawled out of the eye of the spotted frog. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Weekend Write-In Podcast. For more episodes and links to more work by these authors, visit our website at www.weekendwritein.wordpress.com. The Weekend Write-In Podcast is co-hosted, produced, and edited by John Nedwell and Sovon Drake. Music in this podcast includes Q1 Dark Ghostly Slow Building Tension, Q3 Breathy Nervous Tension by Soul Flare, provided by freemusicarchive.org, Dog Bark by Crazy Monkey 9 at freesound.org, licensed under an attribution, non-commercial, share-alike license. There. Done. You're lucky that mad scientist finally left with the evil laugh. I wouldn't call him mad. More obsessed than anything else. Yes, but it looks like he's forgotten something. You mean this rather large bundle over here? The one that seems to be moving? <laughs> I thought you'd fix that. That wasn't me. I think it was the... <laughs> oh no, run! 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 Hello? Hello? Where did everybody go?